Thank you very much. And as I always say, never trust a guy with a ponytail, right? Never trust a guy with a ponytail. And I am Mikko Hyppönen. And it is good to be in Poland. It's good to be here. I come here regularly. And there are many reasons. I, I like the food. I like the people. I, I like the country altogether. Um, our company has, has two offices in, in Poland, not in Krakow. We have one in, in Warsaw and, and one in Poznan. Um, and also there's the thing that your country is called Poland. My country is called Finland. In, in Finnish, Finland is Suomi. In Polish, Poland is, is Polska, right? And there's only eight countries in the world which have a name ending in land. Did you know that? Like Switzerland, right? And Poland and Finland and Iceland and Ireland and New Zealand and a couple of others. So we're in the same, same rank. And there's another reason why I also like, like Poland, <clears throat> which is the thing about your top level domain. I'm really more like a Python kind of guy, but uh, of course I've, I've done Perl a long time ago and it really is confusing. I was just seriously, when I was getting here half an hour ago, there was a car next to me at the traffic light which had the post.pl URL on, on the car door. And I was like, well, yeah, that's what you would, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so, we're speaking about the state of the net. Like, which state is the internet in right now? And I, I suppose the very first point about the whole internet thing is that we all are very lucky to be alive during these defining years. I mean, these are the years when the mankind got online. And that's a pretty big deal. Of course, I look at the internet from the point of view of, of risks and, and crime and things like that. But I, I, I will never forget that the internet has brought us much more good than bad. And you shouldn't forget that either. The internet has brought us much, much more good than bad. Obviously, it's true that there's much more, well, online crime, because the online part wasn't there before. And the difference with online crime and real-world crime is that in the real world, geography matters, distances matter, borders matter. In the online world, they don't. In the real world, you only really have to worry about the criminals who are living in your city, right? If you live in Krakow, you don't really have to worry about, I don't know, car thieves from Argentina. Car thieves from Argentina do not fly over to Poland to steal your cars, right? That just doesn't happen. But you do have to worry about hackers, like criminal hackers, nasty hackers from Argentina, right? So the internet has changed the world. It really has. And I'm also looking at this from the point of view of quite a few years in the business. Every month, I get a letter in the mail, which is my salary slip from F-Secure. And in that salary slip, there's this number listing when I started working at F-Secure. And that's in 1991. Now, there are people in this room who weren't born when I started working for this company. So obviously, I'm a dinosaur, right? <laughs> 1st of June, 1991. Do you know what that means? That means that in, I don't know, two weeks, I have worked for this company for a quarter of a goddamn century. <laughs> quarter of a century, 25 years. So the problems we were fighting when I joined this small startup of six guys in Helsinki in 1991, the problems we were fighting were quite different. Yes, we were already fighting malware writers, and viruses and worms, but they weren't spreading on the internet because the internet wasn't there yet. So they were spreading on floppy disks. Remember those floppy disks? You know, five and quarter inch disks, three and a half inch disks. Some of you have never used them, right? And I've been thinking about those early days quite a bit lately because I started volunteering for the Internet Archive in January. Internet Archive is a great project. It's a project of preserving our digital history. So, for example, they regularly take full copies of the whole web. 
Think about that. That's not a joke. They crawl the whole web, they save all the pages, and they do it every couple of weeks. So they preserve the web, which means they have pretty big hard drives, right? But they seriously do this. Internet Archive is headquartered in San Francisco, and its, its uh, operations are funded by donations. They also archive TV streams, radio streams, books, manuals, old BBS systems, like anything, anything you can imagine. And late last year, the Internet Archive implemented a in-browser JavaScript implementation of the DOSBox emulator. And DOSBox is an emulator that allows you to run MS-DOS, the old operating system of PCs, of 8086 systems. And with that emulator, in-browser emulator, they were able to release thousands of old PC games, like DOS games, that you could actually now run in your browser, which was excellent. I mean, you know, Doom or original Wolfenstein, stuff like that, which was really, really great. And I was looking at the quality of the emulator, because I've played a little bit around with DOSBox, and the JavaScript implementation was surprisingly fast so, and surprisingly compatible. So I started thinking whether we could actually tweak it to make it work so we could actually run old viruses with the JavaScript implementation of the DOSBox emulator. So I got in touch with this friend of mine, Jason Scott, who works at the Internet Archive, and we started a small project. And in January, we then released this, the Malware Museum. I am now officially the curator for the Malware Museum at the Internet Archive. And I think that sounds so cool, I've actually added it to my CV. I am the curator for the Malware Museum at the Internet Archive, where you can go and select any one of, you know, dozens of viruses and run them in your browser. Like old viruses from, you know, 1980s and 1990s. And they will do what viruses at that time did, which is they show messages, or they crash your system, or they delete your files, or they play music, or they play games with you. Because this is what viruses used to do. This is the kind of viruses I was fighting when I started analyzing viruses and reverse engineering malware for a living 25 years ago. And so far, over 2 million people have gone there and run old viruses in their browsers, which is great. I love it. It's excellent. And it's also safe. It, I mean, it's an emulator inside your browser. They won't be able to do any bad stuff on your systems. But I also think it's, it's sort of like an art form. I mean, look at this. It is kind of an digital art a form of digital art. And we have to preserve this. We have to preserve our history. Because if you don't, it will be gone. And these, I think, are important parts of our, of our history. So I'm really happy to be, to be volunteering at the Internet Archive. And as I was collecting these old samples and going through my old floppies, I actually still have a five and quarter inch floppy drive. And when I was looking at these, I, I realized a couple of things. One thing I realized is that, you know, Everything old is new again. And what I mean by that is that the things we thought we had already fixed come back to bite us again. I'll give you three examples of, of old problems that come back to bite us again. So, for example, all viruses we have in the Malware Museum were spreading on these. That's a five and quarter inch floppy disk. And when malware was spreading on floppy disks, the only way they would travel from one country to another was that somebody has to take an infected floppy and physically take it to another country. Because these were not spreading over any, any kind of networks. And you would think that viruses like that wouldn't spread very far. But actually they did. For example, Stoned, which was a floppy boot sector virus, infected computers in over 200 countries. In infected computers on every single continent, including the Antarctica. Because it infected research systems in, in base stations or, or in, in, in research bases in the Antarctica. And we have the exact equivalent for this in modern malware, and those are USB worms. USB worms, which only spread when you physically take a USB stick from one place to another, when you physically travel carrying a physical object. USB thumb drives are the equivalent of floppy drives. USB worms are the equivalent of boot sector viruses. And I'll give you an example of a USB thumb drive worm. It's a, it's, a, it's a worm you actually know. Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a USB worm. It was only spreading when you were traveling and physically carrying USB with you. Because they were trying to reach the attackers, the US government together with the Israelis, were trying to reach a target which was not online. They were trying to reach 
the nuclear enrichment systems of Iran, which were not connected th to the internet. So mm -hmm. the way you do that is that you spread a worm. Eventually, it's going to infect the USB thumb drives of people who work in that building, and they will carry their own sticks in there. But as a collateral damage, Stuxnet also infected computers at, in at least 70 countries, including computers here in Poland and computers in Finland. Another example. This is the AIDS information trojan. It is a ransom trojan from 1989. 89, not 99. This is 1989, 27 years ago. All right. This claimed to be a useful application. It claimed to be a useful application that you would install on your PC, and then it would rank your risk of getting infected with the HIV virus. So it claimed to be a medical application, right? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't. It was actually a Trojan. And after a couple of days of running it on your system, it would actually overwrite your master boot record, the MBR, so your machine won't boot again. Um, and then it would uh, infect your file indexes. In, in this time, file systems were FAT, FAT16, so it would uh, encrypt the FAT of your, of your hard drive. And then it would... Somebody's time to take medication, right? <laughs> I think I know that song. Yeah. All right. After you install this application onto, on, onto your computer, um, if you don't actually pay for a license, it wants you to pay for it. But if you don't pay for it, after three days, it will crash your system and show you this message on a red screen where it demands you to pay $189 to a P.O. box in Panama in order to regain access to your computers. So this is from 1989. Now I will show you a short video of a Trojan we found four weeks ago. Brand new Trojan from last month. It's called Petia. It was made in Russia by a gang of Russian ransom Trojan operators. After it infects your system, after a couple of minutes it will crash your Windows system and reboot your Windows system. And when Windows reboots, then it will enter this check disk phase. So there's a problem with your file system, your NTFS file system. Check disk is running. You can see the percentage is going there. Actually, it's encrypting your FAT, or actually your NTFS indexes right now. <laughs> Do not turn off your PC. Don't abort. Please wait while it encrypts. And then it shows you this. And then it shows you this. Welcome to the Petia ransomware. Now you have to pay two and a half bitcoins to gain access to your file system. Uh, let's just compare these. Like this is the AIDS information Trojan from 1989. This is the Petia Trojan from 2016. There's 27 years between these two ransom Trojans. Everything old is new again, right? Third, ex third example of how old things come back to bite us. Some of you might remember macroviruses which were spreading in Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel and Microsoft PowerPoint in the mid-1990s. Viruses like Melissa, viruses like I Love You, which were going around the world very quickly because people were, well, people shared their own documents. And when their own documents are infected with macroviruses, well, they share infected documents. And, and that's a very, very effective spreading vector for malware. The one we have here on screen is actually called Nuclear, which is another macrovirus. This one um, would infect all your Word documents, and then every time you would print a document, it would add two extra lines at the end of your document. These lines would be at the very end of your own document, but you would never see them on your screen. It would only appear on the printed version. Even worse, at the time, many people were faxing straight from their Word. So you could imagine writing a CV and then faxing it to the potential employer, and they're going to receive that as well at the end of your CV. Well, maybe it's okay. Maybe they don't like nuclear testing in the Pacific either, but it's still a little bit unnerving that's, that a malware is modifying your documents on the fly. Now, macroviruses was a problem that we got rid of. We got rid of these, even though they were the most common type of malware, and we got rid of them in 1997. We got rid of them because Microsoft released Office 97. And in Office 97, they disabled macros. Why? Because of macroviruses. So they turned this feature off. By default, it's off. And it's still off today in Microsoft Office. After 20 years, it's still off, which is very good. 
except this problem is now coming back to bite us. And it's coming back to bite us in the form of attacks like these. You get an email which thanks you for your business. Thank you for shopping in our online store. We have now charged your card for $802. And if you have any questions, please have a look at the invoice attached, which is a Word document. And then, of course, people get worried. Oh my God, somebody has stolen my credit card. I better open the document to see what's been done with it. And when they open the document, they can't read the document. The document is scrambled. And then there's this helpful text which says at the top of it that if, you have, if the document has incorrect encoding, please click, click the enable content button at the top of the screen. And when you click the button, it actually works. Then it decodes the incorrect encoding. But you really shouldn't click that button because that button in the yellow line, the enable content button, that is the button which was introduced in 1997 by Microsoft in Office 97. This is how they disabled macros. They turned them off by default. But when you open up a document which has a macro, then the button will be there in case you want to run it. So now attackers are trying to trick the users, social engineer the users, into making the wrong choice, into clicking that button. And they use various different ways of doing this. I mean, this is one, like you can't read the document until you click it. Or it might be something like this. You open up a document and it tells you that, sorry, this was made in a newer version of Word. Your Word is too old. If you want to read this content, please click Enable Content. And if there's one thing you remember out of Confidence 2016, I want you to remember not to click Enable Content. Do not click enable content, no matter how logical it seems. Yeah, I have old word, it doesn't work. Better click enable content. Do not click it. Don't click it. Even if you get a document which explains to you in detail, like step by step, here's how you click it. Here's why you need to click it. You need to click it because this is a protected document. This is bullshit. It's not a protected document. They just want you to click enable content because then the macros will run. And then they get to do what they want. And it might not be a Word document. It might be an Excel spreadsheet that you get in email, email attachment. And it's blurred. You can't read it. Why is it blurred? Well, it's blurred because security. <laughs> I don't see how this makes any sense. But yes, it's blurred because security. And if you want to unblur it, you have to click Enable Content. All right. So say that you click Enable Content, then what's going to happen? Well, the macro, it's, it's going to do something like unblur the document, so you believe that you know, it worked, but it's also going to run a small script which written in VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, which is a branch of BASIC. And that BASIC snippet will create a binary blob, will write it to hard drive, and then it will execute it. So it's going to run an exe. And that exe can do what the hell it wants. Most often they will drop today a ransom trojan, like Petia, which we just saw, or Locky, which looks like this, or Hydrocrypt. These are all examples of modern ransomware, which all encrypt your files and then demand bitcoins from you in order to get your own files back. And they don't just encrypt your computer, they will encrypt any file share you can see. All right, what does that mean? It's going to encrypt any file share that you see. Well, for example, if you have a home server in your house, a NAS, it's going to encrypt that. Or if you're on Dropbox, well, Dropbox will look like a file share. It's going to encrypt your Dropbox. Too bad. Or if you are working in a company and it's your work la laptop, it's going to go through your file shares and encrypt Everything you have in the company's network, every single file you can access will be encrypted. And now we can all think about how much we can access in our workplaces. This is problematic, right? Now the good news is, if you actually pay, if you actually go through the instructions and pay whatever ransom they're demanding in Bitcoin, they will deliver. They will give you your files back. So at least they are honest criminals. <laughs> and the reason why they are honest criminals is that they know that every single victim is going to try to Google for help before actually paying the ransom. So for example, if you get hit 
with Tesla Crypt, I mean, I guarantee every single victim will find a clean machine and Google for Tesla Crypt help. And they will find victims from last week who will tell their story online in some forum about, yeah, I got hit by this, they encrypted all my files, it claims to use um, RSA 2048, and it actually did use RSA 2048, so my files were encrypted so well, there's no way to de de decrypt them. My backups were from last year, they weren't of any use, so I paid two and a half bitcoins, and they right away sent me a program which worked like a charm, gave me all my programs back, all my files back, all my pictures back. It was very quick. I had some problem with some files, but they helped me, they supported me. Nice guys, you know, would recommend. <laughs> five out of five. So these guys need a good reputation if they want future victims to pay. And by the way, Tesla Crypt, this gang right here, they actually stopped their operations yesterday, which is interesting. They, they got out of this business. And these are all gangs. I mean, these are all um, organized online crime gangs, which are competing with each other. So, for example, this is Maktub, which is competing with Tesla Crypt and HydroCrypt and Crypto War and Alpha Crypt. And there's more than 40 different gangs. And by the way, not all of them are Russian. Some of them are Ukrainian. <laughs> well, that's a little bit unfair. There, there are gangs from other parts of the world as well. For example, there's one ransom Trojan gang from Tokyo or somewhere in Japan um, targeting Japanese victims. But yes, most of them actually are from ex-Soviet states. So if there really is competition, so much competition between these gangs, um, it's interesting to see how they, how they cope with that. Because these are sort of like businessmen. They're thinking about things like return on investment, like how, how, uh, how to get more customers or you know, victims. Um, and one example of that is that last month we found a new ransom trojan called Keranger, this one. And Keranger is different in two ways. Way number one, it targets Max. It's an OSX ransom trojan, the first ransom trojan we've seen for OSX. Why are they going after Max? Well, there's no competition there. The Mac market share of computers is only 7%. So the market is much smaller, but there's no competition. There's 40 gangs competing for the same customers Customers, on, 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 on Windows side. Here, there's no competition. So good thinking. The other thing that is interesting in, in, in um, Keranger is how it scans your network, um, trying to find time machine servers. So a quick poll. How many of you run OS X? How many of you run Macs? All right, thank you. How many of you who run Macs have a time machine? I would say 75% of the Mac users here have a time machine. So for, for those who don't know what it is, it's a backup server. Like you have a network of Mac devices, like you know iPhones, iPads, MacBooks, and then you throw this server in the same network and it automatically backs up all your files. That's what it is. And this Keranger Trojan tries to locate your time machine server and tries to encrypt the backups. Because that's the obvious way of recovering from a ransom Trojan, you know, recover your backups. And it tries to encrypt those. And there's a technical term we use for ransom Trojans which try to encrypt your backups. We call them a dick move. Because this is a dick move, right? Going after your backups encrypting them so you can't recover. Yeah, these guys are dicks. Another interesting thing about these ransom Trojan gangs is that they really do support the end users. They even run ticketing systems. So this is the ticketing system for, uh, for Keranger. So you can leave in a ticket, oh, I can't recover some file, could you please help me? And we've actually looked at some of these ticketing systems. They all run in, in, in Tor Hidden Service, of course. And we've looked at them, and some of them actually are implemented in PHP, as you might guess, and we all know how PHP sucks. So we you know, did some creative um, things, and we figured out we could read everybody's tickets, right? Which, which isn't really very hard to do. And we found like, things like this. This is th from the ticketing system. This is the victim who is complaining that he can't pay the ransom, which is $500, well, in Bitcoin. I don't have $500. I have a small cleaning service. We are maids. We clean houses. I can't come up with this money. What can I do? And then the criminals, nice guys. <laughs> Hello, your new price is $150. <laughs> it's kind of hard 
to be mad at these guys when they're so nice. <laughs> All right. So the mega trend behind the whole problem is Bitcoin, right? This is what really enabled uh, the modern ransomware problems to, to, uh, to skyrocket. And this doesn't, of course, mean that Bitcoin would be bad. It just means that Bitcoin, well, it's a tool here. Just like real-world cash isn't bad, but it's preferred by real-world criminals. It's kind of hard to you know, go on the streets and buy cocaine and pay with a credit card. Or so I've been told. Exactly in the same way, it's kind of hard to go online and buy cocaine and pay with a credit card. You pay with Bitcoin. That's the way it works. And of course, criminals prefer it because we can't see where they are. However, Bitcoin, as you know, is based on blockchain. And blockchain is a public ledger of transactions. Now, the important word here is public. Blockchain is public, which means anybody can go and download the full Bitcoin blockchain today and look at every single transaction done in the Bitcoin blockchain since 2009, when it was started by Satoshi Nakamoto. Which means we can go and look at the transactions done by the ransom Trojan gangs. Your time to take medication. Thank you. So here we look at, for example, like Mac to blocker. That's the address it wants you to send the ransom. So we can look at that address. Now that address is actually unique for every victim. But some of these gangs will actually move the money to a central wallet from those unique addresses. For example, CryptoWall has been doing that for the last two years. And we've been watching that wallet for the last two years. And during those two years, more than 300 million euros have gone through that wallet. 300 million. It's quite remarkable. Another thing which is changing around us right now is that everything is now being controlled by computers and software. Lights are on in this room because of computers and software. IoT, ICS. And this is a little bit scary because there's now tons of things online which really shouldn't be online. Really, they shouldn't be online to begin with. And we know this because we regularly scan the whole net. Well, we scan the whole IPv4 address space, so 4 to 2 billion addresses. And we find tons of devices that are online and shouldn't be online. For example, th we found this house from Germany. That's somebody's house, somebody's home automation system. And it's online. This is a VNC session. N no authentication, no username, no password, which means anybody with a VNC from their phone can connect to, to his house and turn off the lights or turn off the alarm or click on the camera button and look at his cameras. And that's his bedroom. And this is a bad idea. I mean, this is a bad idea. Out of all bad ideas, this is the worst idea. Or maybe it's not the worst idea. Maybe even worse is when you have your power generators online with no authentication, open VNC, or another power generator, or another power generator, or a generator. Somewhere in Germany. Like, I, my German isn't very good, but I can understand what it means when it says Motor start, Motor stop, Motor not aus. <laughs> and you don't really want me clicking on those buttons. But I can click on, and you can click on them. It, no authentication, it's just online. This is a dam, a dam, you know, blocking water, which is a bad idea to have online. And these, my friends, are 16 hospital beds. 16 hospital beds online with VNC with no username and no password. The beds with a patient have charge on them. This patient isn't doing too well. <laughs> okay, so what's the risk here? Having critical infrastructure like power plants and hospitals online with no username and password, who's gonna hack them? Criminals? Well, they could, but I guess there probably are easier ways of making money than hacking hospital beds. I, I, I guess you could make money by hacking hospital beds. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it's probably easier to do it some other way. All right? Um, hacktivists, like would Anonymous go and goof around with these? Well, they probably would. Um, but I don't think that's a really big problem. I, I think we're more worried about things like 
nation states trying to affect another country during times of crisis. I guess we're more worried about things like cyber war. Cyber war. Cyber goddamn war. I don't really like this word. And the reason why I don't like it is that it's, is that it's been overused. Because for years and years, the newspapers have been telling you about cyber war. Every single time there's some random attack somewhere in the world, the headlines will speak about cyber war. Some site was taken down with a DDoS. Hey, it's cyber war. That's not cyber war, that's DDoS, right? Why, why do we call it war? Even if it's done by a nation state, even then we, we really probably shouldn't be calling them war if they aren't war. Because most of the things that we see countries do with offensive cyber attacks is espionage. Most of the stuff, most of the APTs that we analyze. And by the way, we have an APT analysis center here in Poland. We analyze tons of APTs right here. Targeted attacks done by nation states. Almost all of them are spying. Almost all of them are espionage. They're trying to steal information. And espionage is not war. Espionage is espionage. Yes, it's, it's crucially important during wars, but espionage happens at all times. It happens at the deep time of deepest peace as well. And if something isn't war, we shouldn't call it a war. And your country is being targeted with APTs and espionage as well. We've been analyzing nation-state attacks for the last almost 15 years now. Attacks originating from mainland China, from Russia, from United States, from United Kingdom, from Iran, from North Korea, many, many other countries. And especially the Russians have been active right here. Um, we published last year a 50-page research into a Russian nation-state offensive cyber operation, which we call the Dukes, consisting of nine different malware Fam, uh, malware families, an operation which has now lasted over seven years. And for example, before the crisis in Ukraine and Crimea started, the Dukes was the tool used by the Russian government to breach the security of ministries inside Ukraine and embassies inside U Ukraine and military targets inside Ukraine. And we link it directly back to Russian government. And when we look at one of the Duke family members, I believe it's Hammer Duke, um, almost all of the victims are in two countries. There's a couple of victims in some random countries, but like 99% are either in Ukraine or in Poland. And I don't really know why. I just know what our stats tell me. I can easily see why the Russian intelligence agencies would be interested in targets in Ukraine. But I don't really know why they are targeting you guys as well, but they are. So I don't really like the word cyber war. But then something happened last December, which probably changes much of this. On Christmas Eve's Eve, on December 23rd, there was an attack targeting a company in Kyiv. This company, Prukar This company. <laughs> and this company is in charge of the long distance electricity grid of Ukraine. They handle power transfers, they operate the backup power centers, they operate the relays that route power inside Ukraine, most of Ukraine. And on Christmas Eve's Eve, one of the operators sitting at his workstation, a Windows workstation, controlling the relays for power, realizes that his mouse didn't work. This is how it started. One operator realizes that his mouse doesn't work. Probably out of batteries, right? But then he realizes that even though his mouse doesn't work, the cursor is still moving on the screen. And this is a bad symptom. His mouse doesn't work, his keyboard doesn't work, there's someone else operating his workstation, which is controlling relays, controlling electricity. He turns to his colleague and he tells him the same thing. Yeah, actually, I, my keyboard doesn't work either. 
the workstations of the operators have been taken over by an outsider. And they watch as the operator, the shadow operator, starts one by one turning off backup power generators and then clicking relays, shutting down power in different parts of the country until the shadow operator turns off backup power in the building where they are in and shuts down the power in the building where the operators are, leaving the operators in darkness. This happened last December, December 23rd. As it happened at the very same time, there was a denial of service attack against their telephone switch, done with thousands and thousands of phone calls, phone calls which were all coming from Moscow. Ukraine and Russia are at war. Of course, the Russians don't call it a war, but clearly it is a war. And when you have two countries which are at war, and one of them attacks another country with a cyber attack, which is not about espionage, which is actually about shutting down critical infrastructure, I have a hard time calling that anything else but cyber war. So this is where we have come, come to. This is where we are now. Now, this problem did not last forever. The attackers were fairly good. For example, they, the um, serial to um, bus controllers, which they were using to remote control the relays, the attacker overwrote the firmware of those controllers, bricking them. I mean, they couldn't recover them, which was pretty nasty, which means they could not get the power back with their computing systems. They did get the power back, but that did mean that they, they actually had to physically go on location to the relays and, and physically switch the power back on. They did recover during the same day. The power was of a couple of hours. 200,000 people, 250,000 people were without power. And this, of course, could have been much more serious. If you remember, it can easily get very cold in b different parts of Ukraine. I actually went back and checked the historical weather for December 23rd. In Kyiv, it was minus three, so not too bad. But you can see how this could have changed into something much more serious. And this attack actually already started in November. It actually started when one of the um, operators received an email to his workstation, an email from someone he knew and trusted. And that email contained a spreadsheet file, this spreadsheet file, which asked him to click Enable Content. Now, if there's one thing you will remember out of Confidence 2016, do not click the goddamn button. <laughs> Just don't click it. Don't do that. That's the, that's the thing that took down Prukar Patuave, this, this company. And this is the work we do at F-Secure. We analyze the ransom Trojans try to help the users, try to recover their files for them. We analyze foreign nation-state attacks, trying to help the victims of attacks like this. And we do this work around the world, we, including the work we do right here, here in Poland. And we are recruiting in Poznan. If you're interested, go and follow Hackers Poznan on Twitter. That's our account for the Poznan office. And one thing that we've started doing recently is also doing audits and pen tests. And those of you who don't know what pen tests are, they're not really about testing pens, <laughs> right? Because these are easy, easy to test, right? Pen tests is penetration tests, right? You know this. Penetration tests where companies hire us to break into their network. And the sad part is that so far our success rate is 100%. So far we've breached the security of every single target that have asked us to breach their security. We also do physical pen tests, which means you can uh, order us to break into your offices, and then we will come and break into your offices with a card in our pocket which gets us out of jail, which is al always good to have when you do things like this. Most of the targets, I mean, typically t at the target company, only the top management and the CSO know about the, uh, the break-in. No one else does, and we always get in. We had an interesting episode with a bank, a bank from a, uh, a Nordic country, which had, had hired us to test their security. 
There's the security of their mainframe, the largest mainframe they operate, an IBM 360-based device. And we asked, okay, so, so you know, what can we do to, to try to gain access to your mainframe? And they told us that you can do whatever real criminals might do. And we were like, really? We can do whatever? And they, yeah, you can do whatever. Bad choice. <laughs> so we did the normal audits, like, you know, let's scan their networks, scan their IP ranges, let's find the devices, let's look at their, who, who they're hiring, let's look at LinkedIn, let's find the right people. All right, so we learned a lot about the system. We learned who the operators were. And we learned that we can't access it remotely, no matter what we do. They, they, you, could, you have to physically be in one building to be able to log into the mainframe, which is problematic if you want to hack it. Um, so we figured out, okay, let, let's, let's, let's get the credentials to the system. And we got the credentials. I can tell you, I can tell you offline how we did that. But we, we got the credentials so we could log into the mainframe, but we couldn't log in without being in the building. So then Tom, one of our guys in, in Denmark, uh, figured out, okay, let's, let's find an event in that building. Uh, is there any events ha happening? And he found that there's this event for uh, review for the press for real estate price trends in the Nordic countries over the last two years. All right, so he did a fake press pass. He emailed them. He registered as a member of the media. I'd like to come to your briefing. Uh, and the bank was really happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, you're, you're welcome to our briefing. We actually have never had anybody from your newspaper before, of course. <laughs> and Tom puts on his suit and the briefcase, and he goes to the briefing, sits for two hours of briefing on real estate price trends in Nordics, which he told me was the most boring two hours of his life. But then after the briefing, as they are being escorted out of the building, he asks his host, that, oh no, um, could you show me the men's room? I have to go to the toilet. And he lets him in the toilet. And he goes in and he just doesn't come out. Right? He just sits there for 45 minutes, which he told me was the second most boring thing he has done. And then after 45 minutes he gets out and the host has gone. He's no longer there. He probably got a phone call or something. All right. So he's in a suit, he takes his briefcase, he walks around, walks around, oh, says hi to people, how are you doing? Huh? Yeah. And then he finds an empty cubicle, sits down in, in full view, everybody can see him, but he seems to know what he's doing. He takes out his laptop, finds the network cable, plugs it in, gets DHCP, he has an IP address, it's the right IP range, scans the ports, finds the mainframe, logs into the mainframe, the credentials work, he's in. He takes a screenshot, mission accomplished, everything's done, very good. But then, he gets hungry. Then he's like, all right, I've done everything, but the mainframe is probably in this building. That's why you can't access it from anywhere else. It's probably here, and if it's here, it's probably in the basement. So wouldn't it be quite cool to actually get to the basement and find the actual mainframe and then go and take a selfie with the mainframe, <laughs> right? So he tries doing that. He takes his briefcase, he starts walking around, he has to go through several doors, go down several floors, and he does that by talking to people. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Did you hear about what happened yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and they open the door, they go down. Yeah, all right, I'll see you later. Like that. He's, he's pretty good in that. So he, he gets down two floors, and then bad luck strikes. He's walking through the corridor. At the end of the corridor, there's another guy, and it turned out to be his host from two hours ago. And Tommy's like, all right, let's go. And, and he sees him. Oh, God damn it. And the host comes over really confused. Like, ho ho holy hell, how, how are you here? Like, I, I, I left you in the toilet two hours ago. Uh, how can you be here? Are, are you lost? And Tommy's like, yes, I'm lost. <laughs> Very lost. <laughs> and the host is like, oh, all right. Uh, I, I now have to take you out. I mean, this is a security breach. I have to escort you out now. I'm, I'm sorry. All right. And too bad. They go and they wait for the elevator, and Tommy's like, oh, this is stupid. I might as well tell him what's going on, because I've already I've been caught now, you know. So he tells the host that, actually, I'm not lost. Actually, I actually work for a security company. I'm actually here to do a security audit. And the host is, all right, okay, I see. Well, you have a good day. Bye-bye and leaves him there. <laughs> then Tom gets down two more floors, finds the mainframe, takes the selfie, and that's the story. Thank you very much.
I think we will have uh, time for just one question. So, who's the first? There's a question okay. in the front there row. There is a question. So about the ransomware, because I think it's a real problem for ordinary people, the companies, the government, they will defend it itself because they have a, some kind of budget. But ordinary people are really hurt by, by a malware, by, especially by ransomware. So what do you think we can do as a security community uh, to stop this epidemic? Mm. And you're absolutely right. Many of these ransom Trojans make most of their money from consumers, not from companies. Many of them actually try to tell the difference. So they, for example, will scan the network. And if they find, I don't know, 25 shares, they know, OK, this is a company. Like nobody has 25 shares in their home network. And then they will ask for much larger ransoms, like tens of thousands. Um, and then if, if it's obvious that it's a home user, then they're going to ask you for two bitcoins or one bitcoin. So you know, 400 euros or something, something like that. Um, so how, what, what, what can we do about this? Well, of course, users should learn not to click enable content. That's one thing. We can tell that. We can tell that to our grandmothers. You know, we can tell the story. We can try to educate people. That's not going to solve the problem, but it's going to help. That's one thing. People should patch their systems. Not all ransomware comes in through emails with Word documents. Some of them come from web, ex ex uh, web exploit kits. So update your goddamn Flash. Get rid of Java. Get rid of Flash, actually. Get rid of Silverlight, definitely, and so on. Like minimize your your uh, attack surface. And then, of course, take backups. And then take backups of your backups. And that's not a joke. Take backups and then backups of your backups and take them off uh, offline to a different building. If your house burns down, you want to have your backups at your office, for example. That's pretty obvious. And then we can come up with new ways of fighting this war. For example, we recently implemented a, uh, a canary defense against ransom trojans in the workstations that are running our security software, where the idea is that when you install our security software, we drop random files in random folders on your hard drive. You don't even know that we put them there, but we create random folders in weird places, like, I don't know, Windows System 32 slash cache slash something, and we put a file there. And that file should never change. Because you don't even know it's there. You, you're not going to change it. The system is not going to change it. But the ransom trojan will encrypt it. And we then we, mo we monitor if that file ever changes, then you know, we know that something's happening and we can hold it. So things like that. We have to think out of the box. But the most crucial thing on how to recover from, from ransom trojans is backups. Take backups and then backups of your backups. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. <laughs>